David Voorhees is an artist from the Salt Lake City, Utah area. He runs a Left Brain Artist YouTube channel and website in his free time. I've known David for years and we recently got together for this video where we discuss the left and right brain modes of thinking, our YouTube struggles, and of course, acrylic pouring. All right, here's some trivia. Do you okay. know how long we've been talking to each other? Uh, I got it right down to the day. Probably three years. It was, what does it say here? December 30th, 2018. What? <laughs> yeah. It's been six years? Yeah, you reached out to me in an email in 2018. And it was... Because you wrote a you wrote a blog post that was the same topic as mine, and you were worried that you thought that I would accuse you of like copying me or something. And I remember reading it. And I'm like, like I looked at your post, and I'm like, it's obvious you came up with this on your own. It was such a basic concept. It was like how long for acrylic paints to dry or something like that. Mm -hmm. And but you were all concerned. <laughs> that <laughs> it was, That's awesome. I, did, yeah. I honestly did not realize it was that long. I didn't realize I was in Project 24 for that long. Yeah, I quit it after maybe a year or two. And then we got on Discord. Mark put that together. And mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking through there. And you get on Zoom once in a while. But uh, yeah, it's been that long. I can't believe it. That, that is, that is kind of crazy. So your website, leftbrainartist.com, has been live for six years now, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, it was right around that same time where I started making articles. And that's the thing that uh, I was always wondering, like, how you went from, like, a tech background into doing, like, abstract painting. So your day job is, like, you don't program, but you, you sort of work in... Uh, the tech industry in some form or another? Yeah, I'm a product owner, which is essentially I give the work to develop software development teams. So what led to you to like start painting? Like that's just such a weird transition, but it probably <laughs> well, makes sense couple, if you know the whole background. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of things. I uh, So I like to play the piano, guitar. So it's not like I don't have other artistic talents, but I have never been a painter, drawer, anything like that. I honestly, stick figures are well beyond my drawing, <laughs> my drawing IQ. But uh, my brother and I, who actually lived next door to each other for a while, we were uh, Boy Scout leaders of eight to 10 year old Boy Scouts. And I had been seeing on Instagram people doing art with glue. And oh we needed an activity for the boys. And so we actually went out and just bought some glue and a bunch of cheap paint. And we had a glorious time making a mess on my basketball court <laughs> with, you know, eight to 10, eight to 10 year olds. And from then on, I was like, you know what, I can actually do this. And I like to do it. And that's really where I started researching um, acrylic paint pouring and that kind of stuff. And like you mentioned, I actually started a website first. I started a blog because right. I was I couldn't find anything. I couldn't figure out how to do it. There were some videos that showed beautiful paintings that were done, but nobody was really teaching, at least not in a way that I was understanding how to do it. So uh, I started a blog and uh, one thing led to another and that started the YouTube channel and here we are today. <laughs> So that part was probably easy, like doing the website because you got a background that's more technical. I think a lot of artists struggle with that. Like it's the opposite. They have the painting sort of like under control, but they don't know how to do like a WordPress site or even like YouTube, like with all the technical stuff that you got to do with YouTube, I think they get sort of intimidated by that. So you have that advantage. Yeah, um, I definitely had that advantage. It That part... I mean, the the video, the audio, all that kind of stuff is just years of experience at this point and yeah. lots of failures. But it, in my opinion, failures are the best teachers. So just fail often is what we say in the software development business. Fail, fail quickly and fail often because that you learn so much faster that way. That's an advantage you probably have is like, you know, you have the attitude. But what else is there about being like left brain that sort of helps in the art world? Have you ever thought about like what that 
advanced yeah, degree? I mean, I named myself left brain artist because I'm a very analytical person. You know, I want step by step on how to do something. Um, I do a lot of work around the house and there's a lot of YouTube videos like how to uh, fix your car or how to fix the the sink or things like that. And as long as they give you step by step instructions, I can do all of that stuff. And um, with acrylic pouring, I figured out that I could actually create beautiful art by doing a step by step uh, process. Now, there is definitely some uh, right, what, what we call right brain, you know, very artistic, you know, intuitive, uh, pieces to it. But there's also a lot of stuff that, that me as a left brain type, uh, person could get behind and just follow. And, you know, like I say, that, I, mean, this, I guess it's over here. This is one of the pieces that I've done, which I love, which is why it's in my studio. But I, I never thought none of my siblings thought I could ever do something like this, but <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that too. Like you have um, that calculator on your website about how to calculate how much volume of the paint that you need for a specific si a specific size like canvas, mm -hmm. and that's like the analytical side coming through. Which I think a lot of people don't think about that. They just guess at it. And you're in the middle of a pour and you don't have enough paint to cover the whole canvas. It's, it's <laughs> so. the worst. <laughs> Because it takes a while to, to mix that. I mean, it's not like I just pull it out of the tube and I'm done. No, I have to mix it. I have to get the right consistency of the all the other paint or else it looks funny. So yeah, and it actually dries quite quickly depending on what kind of pouring medium or you know glue or whatever you're using as your pouring medium. So yeah, that and that actually came from a blog post. I did a blog post that was just very generic, you know, eight by 10, here's how much you need. I'm like, well, I could program something to do that on my website. <laughs> right. and, yeah. Yeah, I would think too that like seeing patterns in like what works on YouTube or on your website too, I think being analytical helps with that end of it. And even like the financial end of it where I went to college and I majored in art and some people, you could tell that the they don't care about their finances. They don't think about that at all. And then you end up, you know, working in something that's not art. So I think like being analytical can help you succeed with a blog or YouTube. I mean, is that, would you agree with that or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, especially, you know, I, I have policies and procedures for pretty much everything <laughs> I do. Uh, I honestly hate writing them, but because I've been in the software world, I know that if I write down, okay, when I do a video, here's the steps that I need to take right. to make that video successful. Um, it makes a, a, things a whole lot easier. So do you have, do you have like checklists before you film to make sure like the resolution is right? Do you ever film like in the wrong resolution? And then you, you watch it. It's like, you got to reach the made those. I mean, I still make <laughs> mistakes like that. The other day I did a video and I did like three minutes of talking or, you know, voiceover. And I exported the video and I put it up on YouTube and did all that stuff. And then like three days later, I went and watched the video. Normally I watch it immediately. I watched the video and realized that the voiceover wasn't in the video at all. So <laughs> Was the mic off or just not it, plugged in? It, uh, the software, I used DaVinci Resolve and it just didn't export it. It was there. All oh. I did was go export it again and it showed up. So I've done it where I have a lav mic on and the mic was... I had like a parka on because I was in my basement <laughs> and, and the uh, zipper on the parka was hitting the lav mic every time I moved. Mm. So the whole audio track was just like ruined. But fortunately, I was able to save the video because um, I had the mic on the camera recording to a card too. Whereas, And I also had like the, the lav mic was going to like uh, my phone and it was recording on there. So I had two separate tracks. So fortunately, I was able to like recover it. And that video oh. has like, I think that was the one where I talk about how to blend acrylics like oils and it has probably a hundred thousand views on it. And I almost lost that video <laughs> because yeah, because of the audio. I'm so, so yeah. glad I record on multiple. I've done that multiple times with my, my lab mic, but I'm always recording on my iPhone. So it's not near as good the audio, but at least I didn't lose it. Yeah. It's good to have like redundancy built into some of these things. That's a left brain thing too, is like planning for mistakes and things like that and how to recover. But, uh, Yep. So I also think that you need a combination of left brain and right brain thinking. Like if you're totally analytical, you might get stuck in a rut and not try new things. But I think 
like you said, there's like an intuitive part to being right brained. And I think as an artist, you need both. I think most of the successful artists, um, they have a little bit of each because like I said, you got to handle accounting, uh, you yeah. know, how to do marketing and all that. Those are analytical and left brain. Yeah. The business side is definitely a lot more left brained and granted marketing and things like that is, is really, a a, a creative side of the business, but the books and, you know, making sure you send an email and things like that, that's just, you know, policy and procedure, like I said. Yeah. And like accounting, like we're in tax season now and I just, I was working on my taxes earlier and it's like such a headache, but it is, um, if you get creative with that, you get in trouble, but that's where the analytical part comes in handy is like, you come up with a system for like, I'm trying to do it once a month so that at the, at the end of the year, I'm not spending like two, three days doing nothing mm -hmm. but accounting. <laughs> so yeah. do you have like systems in place for tracking expenses and things like that or? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I honestly have a huge Tupperware and I just put the receipts in there. And at the end of the year, I collate them all together. So I need to get an app like Mint or something like that, where I can just take pictures and have it do it automatically. Uh, surprisingly, that's one place where I completely fail. That's funny. It's like, uh, I would assume you would have had like something like, like an app, like you said, like Mint. I use Wave apps. It seems to work pretty well. I mean... If I use a spreadsheet, I would be pulling my hair out. You know, it's like <laughs> it's... I, tried, I tried QuickBooks, but that is I mean, it was built. It was an accounting software and they tried to dumb it down for the rest of us. But it's just it was way too hard to use, honestly. Yeah, it does get really complicated. There's a lot of accounting principles that for someone like us, where it's just like one person running mm -hmm. their own business, it's way overkill. You know, I don't need <laughs> those reports and stuff. But yeah. yeah. And uh, honestly, my brain shuts down when you start talking about debits and credits, even though I worked in that industry for a long time and I still do today. But oh, my gosh, I, it's just, yeah. You'd rather be pouring. It, yeah. If you ever right? want to put me to sleep, <laughs> talk about debits and credits. So you I noticed you switched from like doing blog posts and you focus more on YouTube. Was there like a something that made you want to do that more like more video rather than writing blog posts or what was the thought uh, behind that mostly it was uh well it was two parts it was success first of all some of right. my earliest videos are horrible videos <laughs> but they have one hundred and fifty thousand views on them now and right. i don't have uh, some of my articles have been out there for years but very few of them get that that many views uh and the other one is it's just a visual art so as soon as i started doing yes. videos I started getting engagement from the community, lots of questions, and it was a whole lot easier to to explain some of the things. So I try to make blog posts for those people that like to read and see pictures instead of watch videos. But uh, generally, I'm mostly doing YouTube at this point. Yeah, I think it's so much easier to convey like an idea in a video because I remember trying to write. I was going to write like an ebook about how to mix colors, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking like I'm just writing the, like the first chapter and I'm like, how am I going to demonstrate this? You need like a dozen photographs and it's not very clear, clear to like what I'm doing. So I'm like video would work so much better for this. And that's, that's why I started focusing on video because it's, it's so much easier to explain it. And I, I find it's, um, it's more effective. Like people get confused, like when they read something and they're I, myself, I was like looking at art books when I was younger and it's like, I can kind of see how they made this painting, but you don't really quite understand it because you don't see them start from like start to finish. You just see like right. 10 photographs for the entire painting. And I remember when I first bought like a DVD where I saw an artist paint an entire picture. I'm like, Oh, that's how he did it. It made so much more sense to look over his shoulder rather than like looking at this picture and trying to read the description. So I think, uh, younger artists have the advantage compared to like when I was starting out where I just had books. Now you can go on YouTube and you can watch like some really amazing artists, you know, do a painting from start to finish. I think that's, uh, that's what's amazing about YouTube. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I, I was just thinking, I watched one of your videos the other day about an oil painting book that you, uh, you walked through 
and I had my daughter who's 10 or 11 <laughs> watch it with me. And she's like, I can totally do that. I'm like, yeah, babe, you totally <laughs> can do that. She's very, she's very artistic. So, um, I need to get her some, some nicer paints than the, the leftovers that I've given her so far. But I'm, I mean, obviously I have lots of paints here. I just need to give her some and sit her in front of one of those videos and have her do some painting. Yeah, I think those books where they have like, you know, like a dozen steps and they they have it like they have a reference photograph mm -hmm. and they tell you what color is the mix and like, OK, start with this. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's really enjoyable for me to do it because it's kind of like you just sort of sit back and relax and you know it's going to work out because they figured out the composition. You can see the end result. So I like that type of book. You know, yeah. So. But I mean, the nice thing about the video, especially like the one that you did is you, the color mixing. Yeah, I could have probably figured out how they mix those five shades of brown, but it's nice to be able to see. And they talk about it, like just like you mentioned, they talk about it, but it's that's nothing like seeing it on video. <laughs> yeah, I think a couple of times I improvised because I didn't have the colors that they had in their set. Mm -hmm. And I read reviews on like Amazon and people are like, they're upset with the author because it's like, they have to go out and buy 12 colors. And I'm like, well, not really. You could mix that color from something else because they're beginners. They really don't know that you can mix brown from right. like red and black. I mean, that'll make brown you know, or red and blue yeah. even works. So well, and that that what you just said there is exactly, I think, why my YouTube channel blew up like it did, because nobody was really taking the time to to make that connection between somebody that has no idea and how the artists were the beautiful artists were doing what they were doing. So, you know, my whole thing here is, okay, you know, Olga Sobi is one of the big artists and she does amazing work, but it's not easy to get there. And, <laughs> you know, she's obviously taken years and years and years to figure it out, but there are some concepts that she uses that are very basic that once a new person understands, it makes it so much easier for them to, to up their, their quality and to be able to start making paintings that are more similar to those, um, those really good paint pouring artists. So was she one of the ones you were following when you first got the idea to do like acrylic pouring? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there were, there were three or four that I followed. Um, but like I say, they weren't teaching. So that's kind of where my niche is, is really all, almost all of my videos are about somebody, some like my mom who's 75 years old. If my mom started this today, how would I teach her? And what would she need to know and what didn't matter to get the results she's looking for? And that's kind of how all my videos go. Did you have any experience in like teaching before you got into YouTube? Like you said, you you were working with like Boy Scouts. That's kind of like, there's a little bit of teaching involved in that, I would think. Yeah. I mean, in software development, I was working for a startup. So I did everything. I did marketing. Yeah. I flew out and did training on our software. Um, but I think the bigger thing is my mom is a, t a English teacher, was for 30 years. And uh, I blame her. I think I think <laughs> some of the some of the things That's she cool. did in the household and things like that rubbed off on me. Are you going to like uh, get more involved in like courses and things like that where you're teaching through video like more in depth or is it going to be mostly youtube would you say uh yeah i so i have actually have a community that has a couple dozen people in it that um i'm starting to test a new um there's a bunch of courses out there on how to start acrylic paint pouring but there's hardly anything out there on how to you know once you've started bridging the gap between where you are starting and where the really good people are there's not a lot of people that teach how to to um, how to fill that gap. So I'm working on a course actually to, to give people a process that they can just do over and over again to right. go from, you know, novice to at least intermediate. Yeah. Courses are, it seems like it's a different skill set than YouTube. I think there's, cause it's such a longer like video or series of videos where a YouTube video might be 10 minutes. Of course you need at least like an hour. So it's like a, it's another thing yeah. you gotta like sort of tackle when you started YouTube. Did you struggle with like a lot of technical challenges or how did that go for you? Uh, technical, not as much. I think the video honestly was the, the worst part. You know, I started with a phone and it was bad and then I moved on. I mean, I have, I have my camera here. 
And then I moved on to the this camera, and you can see I painted the crap out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I have a new one that I'm using here. Um, but I, like I say, failure honestly is by far the best teacher. So uh, you know, I watched uh, Think Media and All right, the yeah. guys there to teach um, teach YouTube, and their their whole thing is, you know what? To learn, you just got to do. So do it over and over and over. You know, I'm at, I think I'm close to 200 videos right now. <laughs> and I hope the next 200 are as, as I learn as much as the first 200. Yeah, I look back at my early videos and I cringe. I don't know if you have that experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my goodness. And it's like not just the technical quality, but it's just it's like I'm like extra stiff, more stiff than I normally am. And it's just like. This video has hundreds of thousands of views on it. And you're just like, man, how many people watch this thing? And it's like, you're sort of embarrassed by it. But I think the other thing people have trouble, trouble with is like just the sound of their voice. Like mm -hmm. people aren't used to hearing their voice recorded. It sounds different because when you hear it, it's going through like your skull and stuff. So it sounds like the pitch is a little bit different and people hate the sound of their voice. But um, I feel like I got over that pretty quick. Like, you know, maybe after a couple of videos, it's like, okay, that's how I sound. But yeah, I mean, once you, once you listen to a video 40 times while you're editing it, <laughs> you, you get over that really quick. <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't sit there and, and edit for hours. Yeah. I used to hate leaving messages because you know, the same thing you're being recorded, but now it's kind of like, you've heard yourself, like you said, literally like thousands of times. And then people don't realize like how long it takes to edit a video. And it's like, I've heard myself talk so many times, <laughs> yep. you can sort of get tired of it. But, um, so what do your like coworkers think about you being on YouTube or don't they know that you, you do YouTube videos? YouTube yeah, videos they do. Or... Uh, I've actually sold a couple of uh, pieces to some of my coworkers and I actually, a couple months ago, we did a live demonstration for an activity for my software development team. So oh, I that's just, cool. You know, I got on a team's call and put my camera up and I, most of the, my camera is facing down so you can see. And we did a painting and I raffled it off to the people that were in the thing, but um, they like it a lot. Were they doing paintings along with you or was it just you did a demo? It just, they were watching? Yeah, it was just me and they were watching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've ha I have actually had, we just had my brother, he moved, but he's also, he, he actually is the teacher for the 14, 12 to 14 year old boys now in his neighborhood. And so they came over just, I don't know, a week ago, week and a half ago, and we had a paint pouring party with all of them just <laughs> here in my studio. Yeah, that's the thing is it seems like acrylic pouring is something that, um, it doesn't seem as intimidating as if you're trying to like do a portrait. People like sweat it when they have to draw somebody, but would you agree that maybe somebody could have success sooner like with pouring like maybe if you show them like some basic principles that they'd be able to get something that they liked is that oh yeah so and that's really why i like pouring that's why i started because i was like you know what that's something i could do right. uh, my wife and i was always talked and talked about going to one of those uh uh wine and paint type things all right yeah uh <laughs> and just you know to paint there but if you know you're it's two hours and they're kind of showing you what to do and I'd, I'd probably love to do that, especially now, but, um, paint pouring is just so easy. I shouldn't say easy because for some people it it's really difficult, but it's, it's, um, I really do think that it's something anyone can do. I mean, the majority of the people on my, uh, YouTube channel are 75 year old women. That's, <laughs> it's like 75% of them are between 50 and 80 women on my, that watch my videos. You know, that's, what's cool about YouTube is like, you get all this feedback about who your audience is. So you can see if they're male or female and what their age group is. And then that gives you a better idea of like what videos you should make. Yeah. And it is largely like, um, female and usually older too. So. Yeah. And, and a lot of them have come to me and say, you know what? I used to paint when I was a long time ago. I never thought I could do it again. I got into pouring and now I'm addicted. And I'm like, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly where I'm at. Yeah. You get started. I mean, at what point did you realize that this was becoming like almost an obsession? I mean, you look, you have a whole room dedicated to it. I could see it in the background there. Oh, I mean, yeah. Did it happen so, quick or was it just... Um. 
I had the blog and really I wanted to make a little side income uh, on the blog. And I was, uh, I thought I was doing pretty good. And then I got to YouTube and I mean, I did 40 or 50 videos and then the 51st video just blew up. <laughs> and overnight I got 10,000 subscribers and, you know, a couple hundred thousand views. And it was, that was kind of the, the second the second addiction uh, from the first time that I painted. And so now I love to paint and I love to make videos and just see them go. And I love to get comments from people about uh, things they learned or questions that they have. Yeah, that's a good point. Like it's not just painting, but you have like an audience and they encourage you. And, you know, like you said, the comments are pretty satisfying to read. I mean, I would say 99% of them are positive. You know what oh, I mean? Oh yeah, like, absolutely. And I mean, that's that keeps me going when people say that their painting has improved because they watch my videos or whatever. That's kind of like you're a teacher to them to some degree. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I mean, one of the reasons why I have actually watched a ton of your videos because one of the things that I kind of fail because I don't have that intuitive now intuitive um, relationship with color is. Um, just the color swatch videos that you've done. I'm like, okay, he pulled out a, you know, red cherry and oh man, he made that color. But I love how, how in your videos you're like, okay, I'm a little bit too much. And so this is what I do to resolve that. And I'm a little bit too much. So this is what I do to resolve that. And that's, I mean, that's right up my alley. That's, that's how I learn. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of funny. Cause I take it for granted and like, I don't plan those videos out. I just start mixing colors and, mm -hmm it just goes in the direction it goes in. If I add too much blue, then I got to like compensate for that. And there's a lot of fine things that happen and people, they, I think they're surprised by it because it's like, they don't realize that like, if I mix the color of the sky, there's a little bit of yellow in there. You wouldn't think that there's yellow in the sky, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like counterintuitive. Or, I think that's why people, people have trouble with color mixing. Or the, I mean, the one that was, that uh, kind of blew me away was the, well, there were two, the rocks in the river in All right. the, that you did in the, when it was winter, it was crazy how many colors you used for gray. Yeah. I, I mean, you could start with like black, but it's, it's never totally neutral. It's like, mm -hmm. it's a warm gray or it's like a cool gray. And it's like, yep. and I've done it where I start with like white and black, but then you still end up like working just as hard because you got to add blue to it and you get You have to add a little bit of like red to it. So yeah, those are, those videos are fun and yeah. it's kind of weird too, because people don't see the behind the scenes where you're squatting in a Creek and <laughs> you, <laughs> you, need, you need a camera behind you showing what you're doing. Yeah. And then uh, like a, a dog will sneak up behind you cause someone's hiking and it's like, then you got to explain what you're doing. It's really weird, but uh, people think I'm a weirdo, but <laughs> it's fun. I, I, I bet they're interested. They're like, that's so, so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's only happened a couple of times where I've been in the middle of nowhere and someone comes up behind me, but, um, yeah, it's fun. I, I, I actually need to do more of those. I haven't gone outside and done that in a long time. So I'll probably do some more of those. Yeah. The other one that I remember is the steel, not the steel ball, the, the Chrome ball. That All right. <laughs> that was crazy. The, the, the color to get the Chrome ball. That was amazing. That's the one with my hand that's in there too. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. That's, I thought they would would have done better on YouTube, but uh, I don't know why that didn't take off. But that was crazy hard because it's hard to paint with one hand. Like my hands in the yeah. pot, and it's like you're trying to like wipe the water off your brush, right? How do you do that with one hand? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true. <laughs> it's like my arm had like a crease in it because I had it resting on the table for however long it took me to, to paint that. So yeah, that was that was another challenge. Yeah, those are some of my favorite ones. So How, we were talking about, uh, go, ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say that I know you have a course on, on mixing paints. What, what's the next thing that you're, you're going to add to that? Or what's the, what's the thing that you think people need on top of that, that you've noticed lately? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually have like a dozen ideas <laughs> and I think the next one is going to be like a beginner's course for acrylic painting because mm -hmm. people ask me all those questions about how to get started all the time. So I think that's 
needed. And then maybe I'll follow it up with like a more advanced color mixing course, like maybe how to do skin tones or maybe just like how to do color schemes. So those are ideas that I have like kind of like outlined. It's just a matter of finding the time. Like we've talked about this before. It's yeah. like, it's hard to find time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Color schemes. Again, it's one of those things. My wife, my wife always laughs that she has to address me because I would never match if, <laughs> if she didn't. But I found like there's some website like coolers.com, C O L O R S dot co, yeah, yeah. where you can just go in and say, okay, I want to start with, you know, uh, uh, emerald green. And then it will give you colors that look good with it. And then what I always teach people is, okay, you know, you know, you know, two colors that you want and you need two or three more. Use a website like that to at least give you inspiration. Um, that totally helps. I think you can use a, photograph to start with too in the little bit. Yeah. Yep. Take that's that's kind of neat. We were talking about comments though. I was wondering like um when you do get negative comments, how do you deal with that? Um I most negative comments I normally just say thanks for your feedback. Because <laughs> I'm assuming that they're either I, I'm assuming most of the people are just having a bad day. Or they're the type of people that are going to point it out, you know, a Karen or a Ken, and they're going to point it out no matter what. So it's not worth it's not worth my time. Yeah, I find that there's like a psychology behind it. I think you just sort of outlined it where there's some people that they just they have a negative view of the world and just want to take it out on somebody. And you can never say anything to make these people feel better. It just seems like they just want to vent. But yeah. then there's other ones where I noticed that there's actually a question embedded in there and they're just sort of like frustrated. And mm -hmm. those ones I'll actually, I'll answer those. And it's kind of funny. I'll just ignore whatever negative thing they said. And then a lot of times they'll come back and say, you know, thanks for answering this. I was worried you were going to get upset, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's, it's kind of funny how they turn around when you actually help them. But yeah, as you said, there's some people that like, you could try to like help them out and it just, they just get more and more upset. So <laughs> yeah. And kinda... I, I, I try to answer all my comments, even those ones. And you know, people are Can people. You, so you have the time to answer all your comments still. I mean, I have I, a lot of subscribers, so I, I have so far, I usually get, I don't know, probably 20 a day. So I spend 15 or 20 minutes, um, while I'm watching, you know, other artists, I, usually two or three times a week, I take half an hour and just look at, you know, I search for acrylic paint pouring in the last week. And I just go through and look at interesting things. Or I always try and find small people that have small channels and look, look what they're doing and, you know, ask them questions about their art and things like that. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I have uh, as many subscribers as I do. But I think it, it gives me ideas on how to help people, you know, just watching the art that they're they're putting on YouTube and I, I love the community. I love the paint pouring community. Yeah. I find that like the negative comments come from the general audience, like other artists, they know how hard it is to make a painting. And I think they have an idea like how hard it is to make a YouTube video. So they're usually supportive. Yeah. And it's when like a video goes viral and you get like a wider audience that you know, you get those negative comments. I find, I found that on like, like short form, like on TikTok or Instagram, when you get like millions of views, you're definitely reaching an audience that doesn't paint. So that's when you get all the negative <laughs> comments. Yeah. And I, you've probably had that way more than me. Cause I haven't done very much short form and I haven't had very many, uh, videos that go outside of kind of the paint pouring community. Um, I, I really don't expect ever to get millions of subscribers but those aren't the people I'm looking for. So maybe some of them, someday I'll start doing videos just to show how beautiful the art is, but generally I'm teaching something. So it's very niche. Yeah. Those are two different like approaches to YouTube. One is like, you want to like teach and have an audience and maybe you can turn that into like, uh, you have a course or whatever. Then there's other people that are in the art community and YouTube and they're really big and they do go after that wide audience mm -hmm. and i would imagine that'd be stressful because i've had videos go viral on like TikTok and instagram and it's hard to do like you can try to control it as much as you want but i don't know why one video goes crazy viral and something you spend like 
six hours on like a 30 second or one minute video and it gets like 2000 views. <laughs> so it's, yeah. It's a little weird. Yeah. And that, uh, that, that probably is the most frustrating thing, you know, being a, a software guy, just trying to figure out how, how does, how's Google even doing and getting my video out to people and what people are they getting it out to? And you could lose your mind trying to figure that out. So I try and when it, that, that's the uh, the that's my form of doom scrolling is uh, <laughs> do doom trying to figure out uh, Google and YouTube. But you can't figure it out. I've accepted that fact, and I <laughs> I think that um that's where the burnout comes into play. Like recently, I'm sure you've noticed all those videos about people quitting mm -hmm. YouTube, especially like big YouTubers, and I think. You know, it's wise to like think about that ahead of time. Like our channels are still growing and there is the risk there that either one of us could get burned out. So what do you do to like sort of uh, not get burned out? Uh, well, I'm actually in the midst of that right now. Honestly, uh, I haven't done, you know, I did religiously for multiple years a video every week. And I've done, I think, three videos in the last four or five months. Um, the holidays were hard. I have uh, I have a brother that who actually just started his own course on um, helping people get uh, jobs on YouTube. So being the technical brother, you know, he came to me and you already have the expertise. So we he actually came in this studio and did filming. And um, <laughs> I've been doing that the last couple of weeks, which actually has helped because um, you really don't want your passion to become a job. And YouTube or uh, paint pouring was getting that way for me. So just being able to step away and do something mm -hmm. else creative that isn't isn't related but is similar um, has has helped quite a bit. So do you know what led to like? Well, you said the holidays, but I mean, was it one particular thing that sort of like? No, it's just like you know, you get in that thing where I have to get out a video every week, and then you figure out that you know, life is going to go on if you don't get a video out. And then, and then, you know, the next week you're like, oh crap, I need to do a video. <laughs> and you just don't have the the gumption to do it. And that just, that, that actually grows on itself week over week. So, I mean, right behind me here, you can't see it because I have a bunch of boxes because I have a, an idea that right after this, I'm actually going to film my video for this week. So I'll film and edit my video, put it out tomorrow morning, assuming I get it all done. Do you think you'll go back to doing one video per week or do you, or are you planning on scaling back? Uh, that's the goal, going back to one video a week. If I do start doing um, the videos for my course, though, I may I may have to go to every two weeks or something just to give me enough time. Having a full-time job and doing this is, it's rough. Yeah, I don't know how you do it. I used to do it. Um, <laughs> I would do YouTube on like the weekends and I've never been on a weekly schedule. I just started doing that. I think it's because I got so many things going on. I would do branding deals and other things to make money as an artist. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to do that in YouTube, YouTube every week. Like, um, but I, I feel like you kind of need a way to protect yourself from the burnout in some form mm -hmm. or another. I mean, will you try to like get ahead on videos so that like, if you can't get a video done, you got one in the bank and you can just publish that one or you're just going to do it week by week. Uh, I've never been good at getting ahead, honestly. <laughs> um, so even doing a video like this with you is, is kind of, I'm still doing the video, but I'm not necessarily pressured to, for it. Um, so yeah, we're just talking helpful, basically, but, right? Yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> this is easy to do. And I, I actually want to start doing what I need to do is I have lots of ideas, like you mentioned about your courses. Um, I need to start doing maybe a live, a live one week and a video the next week, or I want to start get, getting some more community interaction in my community. I actually started pouring um, once a month with one of the community members. And that's just fantastic um, because it's just me talk. They're doing the pouring. It's just me talking to them while they pour. Um, so it's a lot less pressure, but I also get lots of ideas for new con or content and things like that. That's that luckily the last couple of months, that's one thing I've been doing is 
I have a spreadsheet that has like 60 things on it now. So if I'm ever, I, I don't really know what I want to do. I can just go to the spreadsheet and say, just choose one and, and make that one happen. I have the same thing. I have a notion database and I'll get an idea for a video. I put it in there and then when I have time, I'll come back and maybe I'll have like an outline and then maybe I'll write down some ideas for a thumbnail so that I have ideas continually like percolating, you know, like sort of simmering in the background. Yep. And then at some point it's ready and it's all ready to go. I could just film it. And that system to me is like so much easier than when I started where it's like, okay, I got to do a video and like you're coming up with the idea and you're filming it like that day. So of course yeah. it's half baked <laughs> or yeah, you got to refilm parts of it. Yep. And it's hard on you. It's hard on your psyche to, to try and manufacture that every week. And that's, that's probably really where my yes. uh, burnout came from is I just couldn't do that anymore. Yeah. See, that's the thing. That's the difference between like a day job and like doing YouTube, especially if the day job is like a more like, um, predictable routine type of thing where it's the same task over and over. When I did that, I came up with systems and I would automate stuff and it became so much, it became so streamlined. You could do it, you know, pretty much in your sleep. This mm -hmm. creative work is totally different. You know what I mean? Like, yep. you think it's going to take you like four hours and it takes you like three days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it is crazy. And, and you are everything. Like you mentioned yes. before, you're the accountant and you're the yes. filmographer and you're the editor and you're the oh, artist right. and Graphic you're artist. the planner, everything. <laughs> so there's so much to do and it's overwhelming sometimes. Yeah, I think that's why YouTubers are quitting. And I think the thing too is like the problem there is when you get that big, you actually need to hire people. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden your videos have to do well because now you have editors and people helping you film or people just doing the behind the scenes work of like answering comments or whatever. And if your videos don't do well, that's a big strain on you mentally. Yeah. So I'm trying to keep it small. You know, if, it, if my channel blew up, that'd be great. But I don't want to like have like a huge business built around it. I know a lot of YouTube channels are like that where you think it's one person presenting this, but they actually have a team in a physical location and people come in and it's their full-time job to like work on scripts, to do research, to edit videos. And that's our competition yeah, <laughs> basically. So. Yeah, that's, I, I, I'm actually in my software development role. I'm in a place where I'm as high as I can go without managing people. And I probably will never go any higher because I just don't want to deal with that. And so I got to figure out how to be a solopreneur for as long as possible. Although yeah. I think one of the things that I want to do is get somebody to edit my videos. It just takes too much time and that's not, uh, it's not my wheelhouse and other people can do it so much better than me. I tried to get my son to do it, but uh, <laughs> no dice so far. Yeah. That's the thing is like, I like editing, but it takes so long. How long does it take you to edit like one YouTube video? Um, it's probably four to eight hours on average for yeah. one of my videos. That's what people don't understand. The struggle behind YouTube is like they watch an eight minute video and they have no idea that's like eight hours of work. I was looking into hiring somebody and it's like the advice you get is it takes about an hour per minute. So if, if you have like an eight minute video, that's eight hours of work. Mm hmm. And I do find that if you do edit to a, like a higher quality, like if you have a, like if you have like a higher standard for your editing, like you have good, you know, color grading and it's nice and smooth the way that it flows and all that stuff, it does take that long to edit a video. And like you said, it's so it takes so long to edit a video. It's like if you could get somebody else to do that. I could produce like two or three videos a week if you were just filming them and then mm -hmm. handing it off to someone else. Yeah. And the interesting thing in, in pa the paint pouring is there's a lot of people that they just, they record their paint pouring and just put it out there with no, they edit the beginning and the end and that's it. That's all they do. And um, I can't do that teaching because 
One, I am not the type of person that would want to watch a 45 minute video on how much paint to use for an acrylic pour. I want, you know, I want four minutes and I want you to give me all the information and to warn me about the stuff that I didn't think about before and get out. And so editing is kind of a necessary evil to make the type of videos that I would want to watch. So that's a, maybe, maybe that's what I need to do is do some of the, some of the, just show the poor and, and some of these educational ones, but those videos for me never do near as well. So kind of a catch 22. Yeah. You know, I was wondering if we're going to see that more on YouTube where people are going to pull back from like the production quality because of all those reasons we just talked about that you need a team to actually keep up with that. And you could have really good videos and not make enough money to cover that team. So I think a lot of people might end up scaling back a little bit in terms of like either how many videos you put out or maybe just the quality of it. Like you said, maybe it'll be more raw where you do some, you edit out all the boring parts, but you don't do like real slick editing that you see on YouTube. Yeah, slide ins and titles yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, especially with like painting, I think you could probably get away with that more. I might experiment with experiment with that more myself because it's hard to keep up with like one video per week and you're spending eight hours on editing alone. <laughs> so yeah. It can actually be, it can actually take me longer if the video is like 15 minutes long. I mean, it's going to go over eight hours. So, yeah, a lot of my longer videos are, are like you say, I don't do a lot of editing. I just, I just cut out or speed up the monotonous stuff. Um, I mean, I, one of my best videos right now is, you know, how to kind of a beginner's guide to paint pouring. And I'm just talking through the whole thing, but then I speed up mixing and I speed up uh, tilting the, the right. paint off. And so, you know, it, I, it was an hour and a half total and it's 50 minutes or something. And I do very little and it does very well, but again, it's a teaching. And I, you know, that one took more time to figure out all the things that I wanted to say and get an outline and things like that than it did on the editing side. So you're doing one or the other. Yeah. Some people actually script out the entire video word for word and they read from like a teleprompter. <laughs> I don't know how they do that. Well, those are mostly like talking head videos, but I would think that there's people that do art videos like that too, where they sort of have it thought out word by word, but yeah, I couldn't I do that over I, for something like that. I can't, I can't yeah. do it at the same time that I'm doing the video. Do you find yourself like redoing like multiple takes of the same thing? Cause you keep flubbing your lines. Like you, you stumble over something or something goes wrong and you got to redo it. Um, generally I don't because I know I won't have time to deal with it. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes I'll say the same thing multiple times so I can just cut the previous version out. But if it's right. in the middle of a pour and what I need to say is important, no, <laughs> I I just say, oops, I said it wrong. This is what I meant. Move on. Yeah, you got to like go with the imperfection of it. But there's sometimes where we're like, like you said, I'll be in the middle of it, especially if it's like an overhead shot because mm -hmm. my lips aren't in the shot. So I'll just say it again right after it and I'll just place that audio onto that part. So it looks like I said it right the first time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've done that. I've done that a few times. Just filling the filling the white noise. If the, if I was doing something when I said it, um, that's always my problem is filling that white noise. Yeah, that's the issue. I think people don't understand that, especially as an artist, is that you're not just painting. You're painting, you're running a camera, you're making sure the audio is good, you're making sure the lighting is good, and you're trying to present at the same time, and you're making sure the camera's not running out of battery and all that stuff. And that's when I get mixed up, is like just talking normally to somebody is fine, but then you're doing like six things at once. <laughs> it's kind of hard to keep track of all that. Yeah, it's it's... It's a lot for sure. And one of them always fails. So you just got to roll with the punches. Yeah, that's why I try to get ahead. And you're talking about getting a video out for tomorrow after this. So that's <laughs> that's where the pressure comes in. <laughs> Luckily, it's, it's, it's cutting cardboard and taping stuff together. So it's not too bad. Yeah, that's why I look forward to like videos like this because 
you're not actually going through a project. It's mostly just talking. And then I think even editing this video should be easier than my other ones. But um, that's why I think it's good to have like different um, types of videos that you do so that you're not always stuck doing something that's super tedious. Like if I'm painting a picture, you're looking at like three hours just painting right there. And you got to figure out how many minutes of that three hours should actually make it into the video. Right? Yeah, I can imagine. I remember you had that video where you did the commission, the huge commission of the mountain, the mountain oh, right, side. Yeah. <laughs> and you were telling me it was hours and hours and hours of painting and the video was 13 minutes long, or whatever it was, 20 minutes long. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was a really fun commission. It was that like was a big painting too. Thanks. It was like a... It was like a Bob Ross painting. Like it was like Montenegro. I don't have mountains around here. So it was really cool to work on something like that. Um, yeah, I definitely have mountains around here. I'm in Salt Lake city and yeah, we're, we're getting uh, a ton of wind right now, but supposed to get another four to 12 inches of snow in the next couple of days. So we'll see know. how that goes. It's actually been pretty mild here in Buffalo for winter. I mean, I got green grass out there right now. <laughs> Yeah, we have stuff sprouting, which I it yeah. isn't isn't abnormal. We but the last snow of the year for us is usually in April, give or take. I've seen it snow in like June. <laughs> like it just might might not stick, but I've right. seen like a couple of flakes come down. That was a long time ago, but yeah, it gets cold. How often? I mean, speaking of weather, how often do you uh, get? um ideas from things that you when you're walking around and seeing buildings or seeing scenes how often do you get ideas for for paintings for things like that it's all the time like um i always have my phone when i go you know walking and stuff so if i see something i'll take pictures and i'll work mm -hmm. from that um it depends how busy you are. Like if I'm walking, I'm in that state of mind where my mind is wandering and you start looking at stuff differently and I'll take pictures. Then that's, I can work from those. That's what I do. And I, I think some people think I'm crazy because it's like somebody's <laughs> tie. I love the color palette of somebody's tie. So I'll just ask them if I can take a picture of their tie. Or <laughs> I, uh, we had a lady that we went to out to dinner with and I'm like, can I take a picture of your the hem of your dress? Because I love how the... <laughs> It, because I don't, I don't think about that stuff, but if I have a reference, then it's, it's real easy to create a painting that, you know, obviously it's not going to be the same thing, but at least has the same color palette. And I can grab what I like about how those colors fit together and how much of one color they use versus the other. And, you know, complementary and things like that. It's, I need to take more pictures. I usually write notes because usually it's about videos that I want to do or, or um things like that but i need to take more pictures i need to use pictures as notes it's a good idea yeah a phone usually works pretty well like i don't need high resolution for a painting in fact when you paint you do get rid of a lot of the detail so you can get away with a cheap phone but that makes me think that you know you've always been an artist if, if you're thinking like that where you're taking pictures of people's like ties and stuff it's kind of like you have that creative side to you that was probably already there all along. Yeah, I just didn't ask people to take pictures before. Yeah. <laughs> I may have liked it, but I didn't ever ask them to take pictures. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking. I have a neon picture right behind me that I'm looking at that I totally took a picture of, and and um, it was an advertisement. I'm like, man, I love that. So I took a picture of the advertisement and made those colors up and created that painting. Yeah, I get ideas from movies too. Like I bought a video projector and that's a totally different experience watching a movie projected on a wall because now you're looking at like a nine foot wide image and I'm looking yeah. at like, there's like someone riding a horse. I'm like looking at the horse with mountains in the background. I'm like, man, that'd make an awesome painting, especially if it was like six feet wide. So even movies and TV shows, you start getting ideas. You know, I don't know if you get that too, like colors or even just like the scenery or. I haven't with movies, but I can totally, I can totally see it. I just, uh, I'm the kind of guy that, that uh, is totally engulfed in me. I'm either bored and I'm leaving or I'm totally committed. So <laughs> I don't think about that. 
I'm like that with like YouTube videos. I'll be watching YouTube at night on my TV just for entertainment. And it's like, mm -hmm. I'll see a video and I, and I'll think I could sort of take that concept and apply it to like the art niche. And it's kind of like, I think maybe one of the ones was something like color theory in five minutes was like mm -hmm. a takeoff of like something else in like photography might have been like photography in five minutes or whatever, or, right. and it's like, you're not really copying, um, a video about how to take pictures. It's like, you're taking the general title idea, like topic X in five minutes. You know right. what I mean? It's just like, you get an idea like that. And it's like, you take that one little morsel and it gives you an idea for a video. And if you experience that watching YouTube. Uh, all the time. Uh, <laughs> and I watch way too much YouTube. I actually, <laughs> I actually had to get rid of Instagram and Facebook because I was just, you know, I, I got in that habit of doom scrolling. Um, yeah. And so I only do it on YouTube because I know that, you know, I it may give me ideas for, for content that I could do on my channel. So. Yeah, I also get ideas for thumbnails like. I'll see a thumbnail oh, yeah. for like a tech review or something. I'm like, oh, that'd be interesting if I did that with like a paint tube or something to that effect. But yeah, thumbnails were the bane of my existence. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, like said, do you make your thumbnails before videos? I'm starting to do that. Like that's a wise way to go about it because I've been there where you have a good video, but then you're like, how will this fit into a thumbnail? Like the concept, yeah. how does that concept fit into a thumbnail? And you're like, boy, I want to publish this. And now you got to spend like two hours at least, you know, like just trying to come up with different ideas. So yeah, I, when I write down an idea for a video, I'll come up with a couple different title ideas and then maybe I'll take screenshots of like thumbnails that I think that maybe I like the colors or maybe the way that they do certain things. Like there's like a lot of different styles of thumbnails on YouTube. Like you have like the split screen with like the the right X and then the green check mark. Like this is the way to do it. This is the wrong way. So yeah, I definitely think about it beforehand now. Are you doing I, that I, now or? I don't, not, I don't. Generally, <laughs> generally it's after I'm editing or while I'm editing, I'm like, oh, that's a great place. So I'll take a screenshot and, and use that in my uh, video. And I'm sure that's, that's part of why my videos don't go as far as I'd love them to just because I don't take the time there. But like I mentioned, I've kind of resigned myself to, to, you know, my videos are going to get five to 10,000 views every once in a while, one will get more, but they're going to get to the people that, that really like me and my channel. So if I get a course out there and, and I can help people with the course and the, the little money I make on YouTube and affiliates, then I'll be all right. I won't complain. Yeah. I've been trying to like stop in the middle of a video and take some still frames for thumbnails just because that's we've all what been I there. Mean, 100%. Yeah. Cause we've all been there where you're in the editor and you're taking screen grabs of like yeah. still frames. And it's like, Not near as good I I... for sure. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a beginner mistake is to like think of a thumbnail as an afterthought. That's like, if no one clicks on your video, it will never be seen. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that like, it's almost like you got to flirt with like clickbait in a way, like to get people to click on your video, you need a thumbnail that kind of like. It captures bit, that attention. Yeah. 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 It's, and the, the not taking pictures in the middle, that's a very left brain thing to do. Cause I'm just focused on getting the video done and getting my content out there. I'm not thinking about, you know, the artistic or the eye capture, the eye candy, uh, piece of, of YouTube. So I need to do better at that for sure. Did you ever have a video take off because you changed the thumbnail? Uh, I've ha actually had a couple of those. I, I have this uh, subscription to you to buddy so I can right. do the AB testing and a couple of my AB testing. Um, one was a review of old. I mentioned Olga Sobe. She did a course and one was a review for the course. And I got, you know, one that it was getting like a 3% click through rate. And I changed the, the, uh, thumbnail and it jumped up to almost 8% click through rate and it got <laughs> way more impressions. So ultimately it, it blew up. So that was awesome. 
yeah that's impressive how that works sometimes mm -hmm. like it's just mm -hmm. you change one thing and it makes a huge difference yeah yeah so youtube the business part of youtube it's super frustrating but when you when you figure it out especially thumbnails and titles and things like that man that's a uh a nice euphoria euphoric high you know i think that's the other thing is people don't realize that like youtubers talk to each other behind the scenes like we could have been competitors like we were both writing articles about acrylics and i could have got upset because you wrote a similar article but i'm like hey you know we're writing about the same things and we started talking and all of a sudden we're instead of competing we're like you're helping me with like my theme on my website you're you know mm -hmm. you're giving me feedback on my thumbnails and it's kind of cool that there's like a community of people that you never even met in real life we never met in life at all it's like it's all through discord and zoom calls and stuff so for living in a you know unprecedented time here with all this technology yeah i really like pat flynn I, you know i taught i watch his stuff for business and he's really of the abundance mentality where everyone can win even if you're doing the exact right. same thing everyone can win and that's that's mostly why um his passion project the pokemon channel that he has is so big because he brings everyone into it even other youtubers that would be quote unquote competing with him there, there's just no need yeah, I, I always say YouTube is big enough for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many there's like billions of people on YouTube and why I mean, why do you feel like you need to like compete with somebody? I think it's better if you cooperate with uh, other YouTubers. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. And like I say, I mean, when when you started uh, blowing up for your color theory, that was something or you're you're doing color swatches and things. That was something that my audience desperately needed. That was something that I desperately needed and why I figured out I did a couple of videos and and just saying I, he's here's who who I learned from. Um, here's how he does it. And this is how I learned. And I got I get a lot of comments on that actually still <laughs> that that people love that um, that I refer them to to you. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the uh, shout out there. Thanks. Um... Yeah, it's it's kind of cool how that works, like especially in something creative like this, that ideas get bounced off each other. I was thinking about um, when I first started posting those short color mixing videos, I remember you said that you actually had that idea and you did like a maple leaf or something, but you didn't post it. It's kind of yep. funny. We both had that same idea at the same time, basically. But uh, it just shows you well, that like there's there's no new ideas out there. Well, not really, but you're still one of the godfathers of that. <laughs> I can't tell you how many copycats I've seen lately. Well, what's weird is I want to do a video about the history of that because, um, for one, I did color matching in college as an assignment. Mm -hmm. Like, you would take a swatch, like a color swatch, and you try to match it. So there's like a history of like artists doing this as like practice. And yeah. There's books. Um, Carol Marine had a book. Um, daily painting and she had that as an exercise where you take a paint sample from the hardware store and you try to match it. Um, I did a TikTok where I matched the color of my hand and I wasn't the first person to do that. Uh, uh, I think Will Kemp did that on YouTube like in like 2010 or 2012 and we did that in our class back in 1990. You know what I mean? It's kind of like mm -hmm. these are exercises that artists have been doing you know, behind the scenes and I just happened to film it and put it on there. And it's people think that that was like invented or something, but it's it's like there's a long history to it, I think. Yeah, I mean, paint pouring, they, the godfather of paint pouring, they say, is um, Cicados, and he did it 120 years ago or 110 <laughs> years ago. So, yeah. Yeah. It's that... been popularized now with uh, YouTube and being able to, and the ability for people to, to learn for free, essentially. Yeah, it, I would say YouTube changed my life because it's like, even when something just like breaks around the house. Oh yeah. A lot of times you'd have to like call somebody to fix it. And it's like, you just look on YouTube and it's like, oh. And it's like, you got like a step-by-step -step visual of how to do it. 
Like just changing the, the world, air filter in my car. The world didn't come to a stop when <laughs> when uh, everybody started fixing their own stuff. Some people choose to, some people don't, and I guess that's kind of the mentality I've taken with paint pouring. Is some people might uh, pay to take a course if I put one out there, or pay to be in my community, and some people won't. But both will get uh, value out of my video, so it's a win-win-win for me and for them and for all the different people that watch my videos. So, all right. So, uh, with acrylic pouring, what would you say to somebody that's just, just starting out? What would they what, sh what would you want to tell yourself if you go back in time, like when you were first starting out, what would you want to know about acrylic pouring? Um, I, I say this all the time in my videos, but you just got to start. Don't, don't prep and watch video after video after video. <laughs> the first time you pour, you're going to learn so much more than all of those videos that you watched. And uh, it's the act of doing that actually makes you better. Now, would you recommend that they start out with like, I think you mentioned glue, like PVA glue, or would you go out and buy? It depends on their, it generally depends on their budget. If you have the money to get pre-mixed paints, um, they're more expensive, but it's a whole lot easier to paint. If you don't have money to get pre-mixed paints, then getting it, you know, I have flood flow trials one I use, which is a paint conditioner, 15 bucks for a gallon. You can, <laughs> with that and a couple of bottles of the little dollar store paint, you can make, you know, 10 paintings. So um, you just got to figure out where where you are and get started. So Actually, my most popular video, the first thing I say is you got to quit watching videos and do a paint. <laughs> start work, painting. This is enough. <laughs> so you would start with like the generic acrylic paints you would find at like a craft store that are kind of like fluid. And then you would use like glue as your pouring medium or would you? Yeah. So generally what we're doing is we're taking a paint, you know, I got all these paints over here and they're very thick. Most of them are medium, uh, medium body paints. And then we're pairing it with glue. Part of that is to, uh, to get the consistency to see to be more water-like, but part of it is to extend them. So it's not so expensive. You know, one of these costs eight bucks or 10 bucks. But if I use half that and half glue, that changes my cost per ounce, you know, down to, to at, at that case, it's what a dollar an ounce. But if I dilute it by two times or three times, then it turns into 30 cents an ounce. And for a lot of people, especially that are watching my videos, cost is a big driver for them. So that's why we use a pouring medium like that. Um, there's professional pouring mediums that all they do is... Uh, lower the the consistency of the paint, but keep the kind of binding uh, tacky quality of the paint. They're just way more expensive. So that's why glue, I mean, again, you can get a gallon of glue or a gallon of this Floetrol for pennies on the dollar compared to paint or a professional pouring medium. I think the professional pouring medium is, um, they add stuff to make it self-leveling, mm -hmm. I guess. And so it doesn't crack either. Like you, sometimes if you go too thick, you can get like cracks in it. Yeah, um, absolutely. So what would you recommend for like surfaces? Would you use like one of those canvas panels that has like cardboard in the middle or do you need one with like wood or would you use a stretch so canvas? I, I generally am using uh cheap stretch for my practice, especially I'm generally using the um, jumbo quantity uh, canvases from like Michael's or right. the dollar store places like that. Um, and then I do buy bigger canvases, but I usually wait till they're on sale or I buy them in bulk cause it's just so much cheaper. Um, and all of them work. I mean, I know you use like the ampersand boards, which are amazing for pouring. I've purchased a couple of those, but, uh, if I'm doing 30 paintings, <laughs> or I'm doing it. A <laughs> what I do is I do a ton of tests. So I might go through five or six canvases for one video because I'm testing, you know, how these paints compare to these paints compare to these paints. So I need a lot of, of uh, test canvases. So I can't afford to have really nice ones. But if I get a commission, I'm usually using a, a cradle wood board or I'm using a, a gallery wrap canvas that 
you know, it's nicer, nicer quality. It just depends on for learning reps is what you need for acrylic pouring. So the cheaper, cheaper it is, is generally better for people. When and people also ask, like DI has, you know, people do crafts on wood. It's nice and flat. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. You can pour over all of that stuff because the color is going to do it. So I always recommend people go to DI and, and get canvases that are at, at DI and just pour over them, give them a good clean and maybe put some gesso on them and pour what's, over them. What's the name of that store? Um, which one? DI. DI. Yeah, oh, Desert it? Industries. It's oh. our it's our thrift <laughs> store here in Utah. Okay, yeah, um, we don't have that around here. Yeah, so. so it's it's the the I almost said Army Navy, but that is not the store. Salvation Army, those right. type of stores. Right. Okay. They usually have racks of old paint old paintings that people don't want anymore, and you can just paint over them. Just make sure it's not a Rembrandt or something, right? Yeah, hiding out it. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. It, um, it totally does. So uh, I lost my train of thought there. We were talking about materials for pouring. And one thing I see you do is you have um, a torch. And mm -hmm. I guess that's to get air bubbles out. Well, it's two things. So because we're using paint that's very liquid um and you essentially i i put a punch of paint in a cup and then i pour it on the painting that's the general way there's lots of different ways to get the painting paint on there but if i have a color that's underneath for example i have a white that's on top and i have a yellow that's underneath and my white ultimately the paint is a little bit heavier because of the pigments that get used in the white the problem is it's going to stay layered because of that. But if I heat up the paint, it breaks the surface tension. So the paint isn't attracted to itself as much and it lets it kind of break up and the colors can rise through it. It's almost like a uh, lava lamp. You've seen how the right, it, yeah. it comes up and then it goes down and comes. It's the same thing. You heat When you heat up a liquid, uh, it allows the, the surface area to to break and it allows the, some of the colors to come up. So in some cases, I mean, you can see some of the Right. Little dots here. These are cells. Yeah, and like for that painting. Pouring, a lot of people want cells. And one of the reasons why these come up is like I've heated this and the lighter paint, this is metallic paint, so it's always lighter, gets the gets the ability to come through the heavier paint and create cells. See, I didn't know all that. I, I thought it was because like when you mix up paint, you introduce air and you get bubbles in there. And if you heat that up, the bubbles will pop. To, but, that is totally one of the main reasons, but a lot of a lot of times I don't torch my paint unless I want the these to come up because the bubbles don't bother me. Some people yeah, bother them a lot. Yeah. So if you were starting out, you could skip the torch if you wanted to. You just might have a couple bubbles here and there, and it's not that big of a deal. Nope, absolutely. And and you probably see this too. The the worst critic is yourself yeah it's true it's the painter's curse we always hate it yep. oh my gosh i can't even believe it and then you show the painting to someone else and they're like i love this this is amazing <laughs> you're like well what about where i stuck my hand i actually did i stuck my hand in this painting <laughs> and i've asked people and they're like I, I have no idea what you're talking about and i see it every time i look at the painting just because so. you didn't have the history in your mind of like what happened when you made that Yep. There, there was a Jackson Pollock painting at uh, the Albright Knox here in Buffalo, and there's mm -hmm. like a matchstick and embedded in the paint. And that's one of the things that they have um, students look for, like they take a high, sc high school class there and they're like, can you find the matchstick in this painting? They might have removed it. I'm not quite sure. But uh, when I was a kid, I remember looking for it and finding it in there. But um, yeah, you're right. You're the worst critic. It's the same with videos too. You're, you don't like your own videos and then you get, hear the comments and it's like, oh, I love this video. So it's, it's always kind of surprising. Yeah. We're, we're totally the way I tell people that all the time. Cause they're like, well, I want my painting to be exactly flat. And then I always ask them why? Well, cause it looks better. Has anyone in the history of my paintings, I've probably done five, 600 paintings. No one has ever said, I don't like that there was that air bubble there or that pinhole there because right. of an air bubble. No one's ever said that. 
But I think about it all the time and I hear people think about it. So I always tell them it, it's going to matter a thousand t- or nobody's going to care. It matters a thousand times more to you and nothing for everybody else. What would you recommend for like practicing? Like if you were going to, if you were going to pour and you might end up throwing them out, can you practice pouring on paper or does it have to be um, something more rigid? You can do it on, I've done it on, it has to be thicker paper. I've done it on um, watercolor paper. It All still right. does curl a little bit, but practicing, absolutely. Generally, I recommend people, you know, buy cheaper canvases. Um, you can even do it on cardboard, but same thing, it kind of curls. But you can just paint over and over and over. So I could paint on this 20 times if I wanted to until I got one that I loved. Um I mean, even famous artists do that. I've I've seen lots of of uh, documentaries on how they use blue light and stuff to see or oh, uh, yeah. black light That's to crazy. see what the painting is behind the famous membrane or the Mona Lisa and things like that. So I think we yeah. all do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I just moved the canvas out of here that I I jostled over because I didn't like it. That happens to everybody, I guess. Yeah, and the nice thing is, I I only use gesso if um, if I need to cover up like something that was oily. But otherwise, for paint pouring, because you're generally using like glue or pouring mediums are very very sticky, the gesso you don't you don't need, and you have a ton of I shouldn't say a ton of paint, but you have a good layer of paint there. So unless you're using all transparent colors, you're never going to see what was underneath. Yeah, that's the thing is like, I think artists will gesso over it because they want to be able to draw on top of it. Where what you're saying is like acrylic pouring, acrylic sticks to acrylic. So there's no point in gessoing it, right? So that makes it even easier to reuse your old stuff. Yeah, it's kind of a waste, a waste of time unless, like I say, if I have a really dark painting and I want to put a really light painting that that has a lot of transparent colors, I might just to give me that uh, opaque layer. But otherwise... I rarely do. I just clean it off, let it dry and paint right over. So somebody that's watching this that wants to start pouring, all you really need is some glue, some paint from the craft store, maybe some cups so you can mix paint in there, some popsicle sticks and some cheap canvases. So that's what would you use? Yep. What do you recommend for like a work area? Like it's, you're so actually literally kitchen, pouring. I, I did it on my kitchen table uh, (laughs) with trash bags for uh, the first year before my first video went viral. I, uh, you know, viral for me, but before (laughs) my first video got more than let's say 10,000 views, I did it on my kitchen table. Now the problem with this is you have liquid paint that, you know, you spill it on the floor and you get it on your shoe and you can track it everywhere. So Um, but if you're doing a five by seven canvas and you're doing it in the middle of your table, you have a lot of area to spill. So, right. But that's what I did forever. I'm ultimately in here in front of me, I made my own table and it has a couple of racks below, um, the, the main table. So I can, when I painted, I have my painting and then I just put it in the rack below to let it dry and everything is level to itself. So. That's the big thing when you're using acrylic pouring, you want whatever you're pouring on to be level. Otherwise, as the paint dries, all of that liquid's just gonna flow off to one side. And yes, I have ruined some lovely paintings with uh, not <laughs> making sure it was level when I left it to dry. So that's a <clears throat> that's another pain point, I guess, is like you learn from mistakes like that. Whereas someone can watch this video and Right there, they learned one way to not ruin their paintings is make sure the drying area is level. Mm -hmm. So do you just have like a bubble level and you make sure that it's relatively flat? Yeah, I just have, you know, a tiny level. It's actually propping up my laptop here to give it a little airflow (laughs) underneath, but that's, it's just a little level and I level both sides, make sure it's, and the nice thing about my table is I built the table with uh, all four of the legs have a spinner kind of like you do oh, right. you see on washing machines and things so you can level them so i just as long as the top is level all of the layers are level that is cool see that's the left brain artist thinking ahead right yeah 
Yeah, and unfortunately, I built it about ten times too too strong, so it's really heavy too. Oh, like two by fours or something, or yeah, it's all it's all <laughs> two by fours and you know three quarter inch plywood, and it didn't need all of that, but it has it. So, how long would it take for a typical painting to dry when you part? That goes back to the original topic of like the blog post that we wrote, but I'm interested in like how like a poured painting, how long that takes to cure. So if you've, a lot of people don't, don't tilt off enough or they use way too much paint and they don't tilt off enough. If you've tilted off enough, so you're, you're going to have like a 16th of an inch of paint on there. And, uh, the smaller paintings obviously are going to dry faster, but, a, you know, an eight by 10 painting, it'll be, it'll be dry in 24 to 36 out. Well, it will be dry to the touch in 24 to 36 hours. Um, if you want it to be fully cured, which means all of the water is out of the paint, that's going to take four, five, six, seven days. Um, but dry to the touch, it's usually about uh, between a day and two days. Bigger paintings uh, like this, this painting probably took three days and it's a 24 by 36. So just depends on how big it is. And canvases, because they are uh, the moisture can get into the canvas and can uh, dry from both sides of the canvas. It actually dries way faster than like a cradle board where it's all wood because right. the water can't <clears throat> penetrate. So it only is drying from the top. So it takes, you know, half again longer. That's pretty cool. And it's like, I'm listening to you and I realize that writing that blog post, it's like all that information is coming out and it's just off the top of your head. And it makes me think that like, we both started channels and it's like, in order to start a YouTube channel or a blog, you must feel like you know something about a topic when you right. start, right? But I'm finding that I've learned so much just from writing blog posts and doing YouTube videos. It's more than I ever learned in school, like in college for, I went to, you know, I majored in art and I feel like I, I feel like I learned way more from like doing this than I ever did from like taking classes. Do you feel the same way? Like you learn a lot from teaching? Oh, absolutely. I learned, I've learned way more from teaching, from taking people's questions. Um, just doing, like I mentioned, you, I could watch hours and hours of video, but the first time I did a painting, I would learn just as much from that than I did for all of those videos that I was um, watching, watching before. Yeah, I feel like I've taken up mediums I probably wouldn't have otherwise. Like, it's just because one thing leads to another and you see other artists using a different medium. Like lately I've been working with uh, water mixable oils. I have a video about that coming out tomorrow and I sort of avoided oils for a long time because I don't like working with solvents that makes, they make me feel nauseous and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just crazy that you can use water with oil paint. Like yeah. Water oils. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually have done a little research because your, your last video was talking about the three different ones that you bought. Um, and you showed in your little painting tote. Yeah. Um, I was like, I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> so, um, that was the video that I watched with my daughter. So yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. And for example, if somebody wanted to start a YouTube video now, you do not need to be an expert. All you need is to be one small step ahead of the next person. And if you're one step ahead of the next person and every video you you continue to be one step ahead of that person that you're trying to help, you're, you, you're golden essentially. Because when I started out, I wasn't the greatest paint pourer. I was learning and just telling people what I learned. And essentially all of my videos are that way for, you know, my video tomorrow is, you know what I want to, I, I have a cake spinner, you know, to kind of, put right. paint on and spin the paint to kind of have it uh, even out. But it makes, uh, when you spin liquid, obviously it's shooting off the side of the cake spinner. If you do it too hard, you're going to be making a huge mess. And I'm going to show people how to make their own kind of guard with, um, uh, with cardboard, just cardboard that I've gotten from Amazon. And again, that's helpful for people just because, uh, I'm one step ahead of, you know, they haven't used the cake spinner yet, but they want to, when they start using the cake spinner, this is the first question they're going to ask. And I've got a video for that. 
it's funny how like with acrylic pouring you take all these like kitchen tools and utensils and you turn them into like art supplies like a cake spinner oh yeah i have funnels i, I <laughs> literally <laughs> have a a i don't know it's probably two feet by three feet also and it all it is is full of stuff like that i mean it has my frog tape and it has a spray bottle it has right. um all my it has sponges uh Silicone the bottom mats. to a two liter bottle because i i turn it upside down and then pour the paint on top and it kind of goes <laughs> out in those five areas so all the time yeah that's another thing is safety like um i might do a video about health and safety with like paints and the one thing is you don't want to mix like your actual kitchen utensils with like the actual painting because oh, yeah. it's like there's contamination problems there with like the pigments that they use in paints really shouldn't be ingested. So it's kind of like if you use funnels, it should be like a separate set. Same with like spatulas. I have like spatulas that are just for painting. And you mentioned working in a kitchen too, which uh, I guess you could get away with it, but it's kind of like you should have a separate space. If you do have to paint your kitchen, like you got to put down plastic or something, I would think, because yeah, that's, you, know, you don't want like... I, I, was the, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I used newspaper, but it's liquid. So it just kind of went through the newspaper. Right. So then I started using just trash bags. I'd cut the two sides and then lay it out and then paint on that, let it all dry. And then I could just throw that away. Yeah, it's funny. I'm reading a book about health and safety and it was saying that you shouldn't eat when you're painting. And a lot of this has to do with like oil paints. It was saying that like, sandwiches can absorb like vapors from like solvents and so you have a sandwich sitting there next to your oil painting <laughs> well yeah i mean you're eating it a sandwich in your fridge and it can it can be tainted by something else pizza that's in your fridge you'll taste it through your sandwich it's the yeah, same yeah it's you got to be careful that's the thing yeah. is like painting like the paints are vibrant they look like frosting but you got to be careful you know it's like especially artist grade paints that's another difference is like artist grade paints can have like cadmiums and cobalt in there and those are toxic and i mean yeah. they're safe if you're careful but it's like you don't want to like get it on your hand and then handle a sandwich and <laughs> end up yeah or have kids around i mean a lot of right. a lot of moms are doing paint pouring um but yeah Jen, i mean it was just I, I i have my table right here and i picked picked this off my table <laughs> dried paint i just yep. pick it off the plastic and throw it away <laughs> So I'm thinking like what else, like I'm thinking about the beginner state of mind for acrylic pouring. And I think we covered most of like the basic supplies that they would need. And other than that, they would just have to, like you said, put the reps in. But as a beginner, what would you start with? Is there a certain pouring technique that you could try that would be more likely to see, succeed than others? Uh, straight, it's called the straight pour and I'll, I'll, uh, send you a link to the, the video I'd recommend people start with. The yeah, I'll put I it in the description, about, uh, because it just goes through the real basic, but a straight pour is essentially, I get a cup. I mean, I have my cup right here. Let's not knock it over, but I get a cup. I fill <laughs> it with my paint, but I put like, you know, red, I layer my paint, red, yellow, blue, white, gold, whatever. And all you're doing is pouring it straight out like this onto the canvas. It's called the straight pour just because you're pouring it straight. But this is a straight pour. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that, the only thing I did really different well. was I put a little bit of paint around. So when I tilted off the paint, the straight pour kind of went over the top of the other paint and then allowed it to kind of come through. But this is just a straight pour. And uh, that's by far the best method for people to start with. So you pour it in the middle and then you start tilting, you lift up the canvas and tilt it around. What so do you, you just pour tilt, tilt it off the four corners? So what do you pour it into? Do you have like a bucket or do you have like a, a cup that you pour it back into? Generally, you're not tilting off very much. I mean, I'm looking at just a couple of drips just on my table okay. here. Uh, if you've used my calculator and you've <laughs> decided the exact amount of paint you should have, you should only be dripping off, you know, maybe an eighth of a cup. Well, it depends on how big it is, but you're not dripping off a ton of paint. And sometimes I paint my corners just because the corners are so hard when you're, when you're tilting paint off to get the very far corner. Sometimes with the leftover paint in my cup, I paint those corners and then I don't have to worry about them as much, but 
Oh you're yeah, not, you put a couple dabs in the corner so it's like already kind of wet. Yeah. Yeah, and if if you have a clean surface, you, all you do is let the paint uh, drip off, and then you uh, use a spatula or something to put it into a cup, and then you can use that as kind of a base layer for your next painting because the color doesn't matter. You just want the wetness on the canvas um, to let the paint move as you're tilting it. Yeah, that's almost you know, like again, water. You don't need it, especially for your first pour, but that's that's one way to recycle the paint that comes off of your canvas. Yeah, I, I try to save my paints because, you know, they're so expensive and it's a good idea. How long would you say it takes you to do an acrylic pour if you weren't filming, like to mix the colors, pour it, and be done with it? Um it's probably a half an hour. It's probably oh, really? 20 minutes of prep and, and five minutes of pouring and five minutes of cleanup. I don't clean up a lot because <laughs> I just let it sit and dry and then I clean up. Um, and then I've made, I've made something like this. This is just a, a, uh, All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a container that I use that they use for, um, mixing cement and I just put some rails on it so I can paint on top and then I don't even have to worry about it. I just leave it. The paint drips into the bottom. It dries. I peel it out. There's no cleanup essentially. Can um, you reuse the dried drips? Like, can you like glue that down or something or are they just so small that you just throw them out? Most, if they're bigger. Yeah. So I have used those, uh, as, um, if they're really big, I've put them together and used them to make, um, bookmarks. I've oh, used them cool. for cabochon jewelry. That's the jewelry that's kind of a metal face. You put the painting inside of the metal face, and then you put one of those clear um, stones, like shiny stones, on top. You just glue it right on top of your painting, and then you can see your pour through that. And it's just like a brooch jewelry like that. It's called cabochon jewelry. Um, I've used it uh, to do... What's that thing we had to do in high school where you cut everything out of a... Uh, magazine collage, collage. you can yeah. use it to do collages and things i've had i've seen people that use it and they do a collage like on the front of a journal or things like that there's tons of things you can do with the leftover i can see why this is addictive because there are so many ways you can branch off it's almost like marbleizing paper where you get like this colorful abstract abstract pattern and i could see like crafters wanting to use that for like you said bookmarks mm -hmm. or designs on journal covers or something like that, or even a sketchbook. Yeah. I've had people paint pour on the back of their, uh, phone case. You can paint oh, pour cool. on this. Uh, and then you just put a little, uh, varnish or something on top to give it a kind of a hard surface computers. I've seen them do it on. I think they're crazy, but you know, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Water and computers <laughs> don't mix very well, but you know, if you do it right, it's, it's a, a cool way to personalize stuff. So what do you use for varnish on your acrylic uh, paintings? Uh, I use, lately it's the Liquitex um, varnishes, gloss varnish generally. And um, there's lots of different ones that you can use. Most of the sealers, most of the acrylic paint sealers will work. Um, I have problems with, uh, especially big paintings like this. I had problems, one, which, it was really expensive to use like a, Grumvar or whatever that's called. Oh, Gamvar. Um, yeah. So I started using, um, I actually saw an artist that does big paintings that uses the gloss varnish, mixes at 50, 50 with water, even though the label says specifically don't do that. Um, <laughs> but then I take a, a damp cloth, not, not a damp cloth, a, like a microfiber cloth and just wipe it on in lay in eight by eight sections because it starts to get sticky and you do that three or four times you have a nice shiny surface that has no um brush marks because that was my problem brush marks are i hate how they look yeah especially on like a pour where it's supposed to be like a smooth surface mm -hmm. and with like a representational painting there's brush marks in there so if you got brush you marks go. in your varnish it's not that big of a deal right what I didn't like about the acrylic like gloss varnish is that it's not reversible. So like you said, it starts to dry and you start getting brush marks in there. You start to sweat it. Um, but your approach, I think you have a video on that, don't you? How you yeah. burnish it. 
I'll have to link that down there too for uh, anyone that that's interested in seeing that. Um, yeah, and you you can do you can do like something that'll that'll get taken off. I for good or for evil, I don't think of my stuff as fine art. I think of it as a craft art. Um, so honestly, even varnish this will last decades. How it is, but if I have it in front of uh, I don't have it in front of a window, but if I have it in front of a window, just like with all the paints, it can, um, it can lose its luster and kind of, cause acrylic paint breaks down in ultraviolet light. So. Yeah. It's, some varnishes protect with like from UV and all that stuff, but, um, and the Liquitex has the UV, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not expecting it to last centuries. And even <laughs> artists like Rembrandt, they weren't expecting that to last centuries. That's why they painted over it. It was just painting. So that's my yeah. that's my view. I other people other people ask me about that all, all the time. Do you have a you know a layer where I can take off the varnish and add new varnish? You know, if it yellows or things like that. And so I one a lot of the people that are doing this are doing it on a budget, and there's no way they're going to be able to do it that way. So I don't worry about it because I'm catering to those people that want to do it, make their own art, make their own, um, their own craft, just make something themselves. They're not looking to sell it for thousands of dollars. They're not looking for it to last millennia. Yeah. It's more of, like you said, it's a hobby. And I think everyone should have a hobby because it's like, um, you know, you're stressed out from your job and you come home and you want to get absorbed in something and watching TV mm -hmm. only, I mean, it's not satisfying because it's passive. Whereas yep. if you trade in some of that TV time for acrylic pouring, you might have paintings hanging on your wall that you're proud of like you do. And I think that's more rewarding than just sitting there passively. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I love being, I, I probably have 20 paintings around my house and I love being able <laughs> to see, I did that. And I remember when I did it and I remember the problem, you know, even the, even the, where I got my shirt sleeve in this one. I remember all that stuff and <laughs> I will forever. You know, what's weird is I have a painting here from 2006, I think it is. And I've heard other artists talk about this, but I would often listen to audiobooks when I'm painting, especially before I got into like filming myself painting. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll look at a painting and I remember the book that I was listening to. That's crazy. <laughs> I could totally see that though. It um sometimes yeah, it's it wears like the off. smell the smell at grandma's house. You smell yeah. something like I totally remember grandma's house and we did this. I could totally see that. There's a connection there somehow, especially recent ones. It's I look at it and like, oh yeah, I remember that part about that book and where they talk about such and such. It's just so weird. There's something in your brain that connects that visual with that book. Because you're mm -hmm. staring at that painting for like three hours while you're listening to a book. It sort of gets connected somehow. It's weird. I love, I never thought about it that way, but to that totally happens with my painting <laughs> all the time. I see something and I'm like, yeah, I remember I was doing this. And sometimes I remember what I did after the painting just because it was so memorable. I don't know about you, but I remember like the places I lived at too when I painted that. I don't know, maybe you lived in the same place the whole time you took this up or not. Yeah, uh, but... so far, yes. Oh, I get that. And then it's also like maybe things that happened, like I painted that during the holidays or I painted that when I was on vacation. Yeah. To, but I mean, sometimes I painted outside, sometimes I painted on my living room. I started in here, you know, we moved all the stuff out to my quote unquote studio. Um, but yeah, I can, I can totally see that. That's interesting. I'm, I need to look around at my pictures and see if I remember stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. They got your old paintings. Yeah. You probably, I mean, do you paint outside of like filming YouTube videos? Like, do you just pull out a canvas and start pouring or is it only for like teaching? I out? try to, cause I don't want paint pouring to be a job. Right. So I try to, uh, paint outside and I, I, I like to, if I have an idea, I like to try it out first before I record, um, just to give me an idea. I don't always do that because sometimes the learning that I have while I'm videoing is important for people to see because I think it's important for people to see how I uh, I'm thinking about what's happening and I kind of talk through that. That's why I really like I said. That's why I really love your 
your um, swatch things is because you're always talking about, oh, wait, crap, I have too much blue <laughs> in here and I need to add some yellow to tone it down or, you know what, it's not light enough. Let's add, add some white. And the process of learning is important in my videos. So I don't, yeah. I don't want my videos to be, oh, this is perfect. This is how you do it every right. single time. I know at the end of this video, I'm going to get a perfect, beautiful painting. Not a chance in Hades. Most of the time I get to the end, I'm like, wait a minute. This is great, but I wish I would have done this and I wish I would have done this. Because um, I think that's how most of us are. Yeah, I think uh, you hit a very important point there is that it's more authentic. Yeah. Like if I cut out all the mistakes, people are going to be like, how come when I do it, I got all these problems. But when I watch Chris do it or I watch David pour acrylics, it looks like it's it's magic. Yeah. And I can think back to, like you said, to some of those color mixing videos where I put way too much blue in there and I end up battling it. And when I'm recording it, I'm like, I feel like I should bail on this, but it's like, no, this is a challenge. And you just add more and more paint until it gets balanced out. And I think people like to see me struggle sometimes, like trying to match well, a color. It's easier to learn that way. We don't learn, you don't learn from perfection. You learn from mistakes. <laughs> That's true. The other thing I had happen like that too was um, the video where I'm blending acrylics like oils. I had like a cheaper watercolor brush. I had like soft bristles on it to like blend the areas away. Mm -hmm. And the bristles came out and I just pull out like a utility knife, take the blade and it just pop out the um the hair right off the painting and you just smooth it over and that's how you take care of it and it's like now someone just learned how to like get the hairs out of their painting too instead of just like me turning the camera off or pausing it or whatever so yeah i i do the same thing with goobers i actually have this set of of tongs you kind of see it here oh, that tweezers yeah i i use to grab goobers because you don't your paint <laughs> is not always smooth there's always some little piece of paint that got dried that was in your mixture or you didn't mix it enough. So you have some paint that isn't as liquid as the rest. And at, because it's liquid, once you tilt it out, you can totally see that, especially if you have a light shining on it, you can totally see where it's bumpy or so. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, I, especially with this type of pouring perfection is boring. <laughs> it's, it's the imperfection that makes them so good. You know, it's interesting. I did um, abstract painting in college and I did pouring, but it wasn't this type of pouring. It was more, the paint was like thinner. Mm -hmm. So there was an artist, uh, Helen Frankenthaler, that did painting like that. It's more like a watercolor look where it flows more. Yeah. And I just remembered that it was like a fine balance between like you're having fun, but like it felt like one false move and it's like, uh oh. I'm in trouble here. <laughs> like, I, it's like, you got to start over. And it's like, I don't, do you feel that with like acrylic pouring or is it that you, if you mess up, you just let it dry and go over it? Uh, or you just pour more. Like if, more if, I do a pour, if I do a pour and I get it out and I really hate it, I'm, I either have paints already mixed up or I mix up more paints, pour right over the top before it even dries to <laughs> save it. Or sometimes I take the paint that's left in the cup and make little drizzles on the painting because so, some paintings are boring. I've, I've done paintings where I do it and it's like, that looks like a, you know, it looks like the sky on a sunny day. There's nothing cool about that. It's blue. <laughs> it's just different shades of blue. So, um, but I just like to move ahead rather than, than either try and perfect it or wait and try and do something else. Some, sometimes, you know, especially when you're dealing with uh, transparent and opaque paints, uh, it dries and the paints were way more transparent than you were expecting. So you get mud because you're just seeing layers and layers of transparent paint <laughs> yep. and it's brown or gray or things like that. And it's just ugly. So you just paint over it. But usually I try and keep going. Although that's another problem is some people try and force their painting to be beautiful sometimes you just got to let the painting do what it wants. More often than not, you have to let the painting do what it wants. Yeah, that comes up in watercolor a lot where you can plan as much as you want, but the paint follows follows the laws of physics and it just flows to where it wants to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's kind of like acrylic pouring in that way. And it's like you were saying, I think that's kind of the theme is like, do you chase 
do you chase a painting until it's like perfect or do you just do you just let it go and move on to the next one or do you ever do that just like throw out a canvas or i i have but i don't do it very often yeah. and usually usually it's because i do a pour and i let it dry and it kind of dries different than it was when it was wet because paint acrylic paint is much different um right yeah especially the way i do it where you, it's all liquid and all kind of mixing together it's much different dry than it was wet um and sometimes i just if nobody around me i ask my wife and my son and sometimes i take a picture and send it to people and if they're all like i i don't like that at all <laughs> i get rid of it but the funny thing is there's some paintings that we all hated and i specifically put them in a video and say i hated this painting and do it and i get comments that are like are you kidding me that's the most beautiful painting ever it, i mean it's abstract Every, all of us are different in in how we see stuff yeah that's the thing about feedback is i feel like um your friends and your family will, will be nice to you unless you have someone that you can trust that understands like that feedback is important critical feedback mm -hmm. is important and they know how to do it without being mean but the thing is is like when you put it out on the internet you're inviting anybody and everybody <laughs> to comment on it right and there, there's that's, people there to tell you that your painting sucks right <laughs> yeah that's totally true <laughs> But you, I mean, you got to balance it out over the people that don't. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you and I even got together is because we needed somebody that wasn't going to pull punches and to give right. us critical feedback about our YouTube and our blog posts and our website and things like that. And it's just, <laughs> it's, it's really critical to, to success in this type of industry. Yeah. We do that a lot with like thumbnails. What do you think about this thumbnail? And yep. everyone chimes in and it's like, I don't know, but then the, the real judge is the audience, right? Like you, yeah. you look at the click through rate and it's like, Oh, we're all wrong. It was this other one that worked better. And that's the thing about like split testing is like, I'll design a split test and it's like, I have a new thumbnail that I think is going to do better. And two buddy will test it out. And it's like, what I thought would do better actually did worse. So yeah. It's, it shows you like with like like graphic design too, where people design for like um, like a marketing campaign and you have an idea of like, oh, this should work well. But then if you actually test it and measure the results, I mean, that design might not do well at all. You know what I mean? Like I geek out on that being a <laughs> yeah. uh, data anal analytical type guy. I love to I love to go back to my videos and say, OK why you know why did people watch this video more why did they click on it more you know why did it compare to another video do better and you know some of it's some of it's science you can actually see the numbers and make make assumptions based on those numbers and some of it's just like it goes back to that well, why youtube why google why did you do this <laughs> yeah you know i think there's an element of luck in there i hear that feedback that um if your video doesn't get views that means it's bad I actually disagree with that because yeah. I've taken the exact same video and put it on another platform and it does really well. It'll do like 10, a hundred times more views than on like YouTube or vice versa. You know, right. it's not just short form. Like people will be like, well, of course you get more views on TikTok, but I've done this with like long form videos too. And you put them on another platform and it's like that other platform either found the right audience or it's just the luck of the draw and the algorithm on YouTube didn't find the right audience for that video at that moment. Yeah. And it's like, so I don't think that because your videos aren't doing so well that they suck. I think it's just that maybe you need to tweak the title or the thumbnail, or maybe YouTube just was having a bad day. <laughs> I don't know or maybe works. YouTube's not the, not the place where, the the people that want to watch that video are yeah you know the i've said this before the feedback is so slow on youtube like mm -hmm. i'll put up a video i think it's a good idea i look at it a month later and i'm like wow that bombed like i shouldn't do any more of those so you move on and do other videos and then six months later that video is taking off like crazy it's like you look at the analytics and it's just going up like this and then right. you sort of feel regret because it's like i should have just doubled down on that idea and made more and more of those videos. So that's kind of where like something like TikTok or reels on Instagram or Facebook, you get that feedback within a couple of days and then you can build on that. But I feel like YouTube is like so slow. I don't know why it's like that. 
but there's other people on YouTube. I think if it's found through browse, like then it could take off in a matter of days. Right. But maybe it's the search results or the search traffic that um, is slow to like catch on. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah, it's it it's crazy. I you know I think I think YouTube has a method that where they test videos over and over and over again because I have seen specific times where like at seven days something changes and it takes off. At fourteen days something changes, it takes <laughs> off. At twenty eight days, ninety days, even one hundred and eighty days, um, it's like right around that time frame. YouTube says, "Oh wait a minute, we're going to try this video with some more people," and they find the right people. And then it takes off. So that's one of the reasons why I tell people you got to put videos out there. You got to put 50 videos out there if you want to be <clears> successful <throat> on YouTube, because sometimes it takes that long for YouTube to figure out who to show your videos to and when to show them so that you have the right video at the right time for the right person. Yeah, there's a lot to it. It's um, it's such a deep topic. I mean, we could do a whole video about YouTube. <laughs> it's we, like... he, yeah, well, we may need to, depending on how people like this one, you may need to, to <laughs> do something like that. I think there's a lot of artists out there that that would be interested specifically to a conversation on YouTube about art, which not a lot of not a lot of people do. Most of them are, you know, faceless channels or or talking head channels, and we really don't have that type of channel. Yeah, uh, I think we both do more like teaching art channels, basically. Yep. I mean, I'd like to get some some of my videos out there to like a larger audience, but it's like I would say the majority of my videos are like teaching people how to do stuff. Yeah, amen to that. But like I say, I've I've kind of I, I'm not looking to get millions of views. I'm looking to get the five to ten thousand that I know are are in need of the information I'm providing for that one video. And that's good enough for me. If it grows bigger, that's just a cherry on top. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd rather have that anyways, because it's like, it's kind of cool to have a community. Like you see the same people coming back and commenting all the time. And you can kind of tell mm -hmm. that they're experimenting with the things you're talking about too. So that's rewarding rather than just having someone look at one video and never watch another one again. Yeah, you know, and it's it's crazy that I know so many people based on their YouTube username and not on them in person. <laughs> like, really? Like, there's some YouTubers. I, I don't even know their real name. I know their handle, but I know a lot about their life. I know, you know, what they do on Saturday afternoons just because we've had a conversation in YouTube for literally years, some of them. Yeah, that's... It's pretty cool. And it's the same like what we talked about, uh, us talking on Discord and all that. It's like we never met in person, but I feel like I know who you are and all that stuff. And it's like it's all through just the Internet. And yep. a lot of it is creative work. And uh, I don't know. I like where it's going, you know? Yeah. Amen to that. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, hopefully at some point I can do what you did and quit your day job and just do this full time. <laughs> my day job quit me. So, <laughs> well, that's true. Your day job did quit you. You were, you were kind of pushed out the window for that. One. <laughs> Worked out good for me though. I, I, man, this is like my dream job. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I've always wanted to do this and it's uh now it's a reality and I totally appreciate it. It's awesome. Well, you're, you're kicking butt and taking names. So <laughs> glad to be a part of it. <laughs>